saved a wretch like me. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let 
let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Amen, amen. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful to be here? We're going to do a little bit of technical right quick, Andrew. Uh, Chris um, is really hot, uh, you know, so he's loud. So you can bring him down in the house. Okay. Uh, you know, so uh, you know, we're going to worship and we're going to praise God this morning as we come together. I want to read from you, read to you from Psalms 150. It says, praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty works. Praise His unequaled greatness. Praise Him with the blast of the ram's horn. Praise Him with the lyre and harp. Praise Him with the trumpet and dancing. Praise Him with the strings and flutes. Praise Him but with a clashing of cymbals. Praise Him with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That is what we are here today to do, is to praise and to worship our God, God Almighty. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You so much, dear Lord, for today. God, I thank you for what you have done for us. And God, as we come together, dear Lord, in your house to praise and to worship you, God, we join together with one heart and one kindness, dear Lord, as we worship you, as we worship you across this country and across this state and in this city. And God, as all the others are there, dear Lord, with us, God, we pray that you would receive this as a sweet incense unto you. That through the words that we sing, God, that we would worship and praise you and honor you. With our heart being bowed below, being bowed low to you, God, that you would receive this as a sweet incense unto you. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand as we sing praises to God. To God. God be the glory, great things He has done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer. The promise of God, the vilest offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Great things He has taught us, great things He has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be Our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the people rejoice 
praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father, to Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. All right. Are y'all happy to be here this morning? We're going to give praise and worship to God, and I'm going to need to show on your faces this morning. You're kind of making me nervous and scaring me, okay? So just smile at me. Let me see all the pretty faces, and we're going to sing out. We're going to shout to the heavens because it's about praising God this morning. Amen? Let's sing that chorus again. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear His voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, call to the Father, through Jesus the Son, and give Him the glory, great things He has done. Amen. Aren't you glad that we could come here and praise this morning? So we're going to talk more. We're going to talk more about God and the things that He can do for us in the same power that anything that we face, God can see us through it no matter what. So sing loud as we can go through this next song. I can see the waters raging at my feet. I can feel the breath of those surrounding me. I can hear sounds of nations rising up. We will not be overtaken. We will not be overcome. I can walk down this dark and painful road. I can face every fear of the unknown. I can hear all God's children singing out. We will not be overcome. Taking, we will not be overcome. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us. He lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when He speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea, lives in us. He lives in us, He lives in us, lives in us. We have hope that His promises are true. In His strength, there is nothing we can do. Yes, we know there are greater things in store. We will not be overtaken, we will not be overcome. Sing it. The same power that rose Jesus from the grave, the same power that commands the dead to wake, lives in us, lives in us. The same power that moves mountains when He speaks, the same power that can calm a raging sea, lives in us, lives in us, He lives in us. Lives in us greater and greater is He that is living in me. He conquered our enemy. No power of darkness, no weapon prevails. We stand here in victory. Oh, and greater is He that is living in me. He conquered our enemy.
you glad for that power this morning. Now we're going to go as we continue in worship and talk about what God has done. He is our cornerstone. He is before us. He is behind us. He is everything. So let's just shout, lift our hands, and give praise to everything that he is this morning. Sing with us and worship with us. or bring to him he's here to meet you at your need if there's a struggle that you have he's here if you just simply need to call out and to praise him this morning he is here he is here to help us with our needs and our struggles psalmist in Psalms 55 tells us listen to my, to my prayers O God 
do not ignore my cry for help. Please listen and answer me, for I am overwhelmed by my troubles. My enemies shout at me, make loud and wicked threats. They bring trouble on me and are angry and hurt. God, listen to my prayers. God, we ask that you would listen to our prayers this morning. God, I pray, dear Lord, that you would be with the ones that struggle today. God, that you would hear their cries. God, I pray, dear Lord, that you'll be with the ones that are struggling financially. God, I pray that you'll be with the ones, as the psalmist says, that has their enemies shouting at them. And all this world, dear Lord, and the struggles are just simply crashing down upon them. God, I pray that you would hear our cries. God, I pray that you would answer us today. God, that your spirit would move in. And God, that he would allow us to feel his presence and know that he is already at work in our lives. God, we thank you, dear Lord, for what you have already done, even in the midst of the struggles. God, we give you praise this morning. God, we thank you for the healing touch. We thank you for the mercy that you have given to us. God, we thank you for your love and for your mercy that you've poured out upon us. We thank you for your blessings that you have given to us. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, we know whom our blessings come from. We know who you are. God, I pray, dear Lord, today, dear Lord, as we give up these words, dear Lord, that we open up our hearts and we bow before you humbly in awe of who you are. God, we ask that you will minister to us today. Continue to do that. Continue to do it as we break your word. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today, I want to want to talk to you about a passage of scripture that really just simply, this passage focuses in, so if you can turn to Genesis chapter 45, and there's one verse in there, but there's a phrase that we have that I want us to focus on. So go ahead and turn to that passage of scripture as we have it there. Today's message is entitled, Remember God's Plan. We get shaken and there's all too often too many times that we get led astray or we we lose track of what the real plan that God has for us. I was talking with a friend of mine last night over dinner and he said, you know, as as Christians and as churches, we we do people in injustice. Because whenever they come to the altar and they receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we tell them and we say that your life is going to be better. So basically, we just simply back up this truck of blessings and love uh, that's going to be poured out upon you. And we say, hey, your life is going to be fine from now on. Genesis 45, verse 5, and it reads this way in the New Living Translation. But do not be upset. And do not be angry with, you, with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve life. Now, why was Joseph there? So this is about the story of Joseph. So why was Joseph in Egypt? Was Joseph in Egypt to save the Israelites? No. Why was Joseph in Egypt? To preserve life. God's plan 
And this particular point was not just simply to save Joseph. It wasn't to save Jacob or Israel or his family. It wasn't just simply to save the Egyptians. It was to save or to preserve life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, came to this earth not just to save the Jews, but to save life. Paul, in Romans chapter 5, verses, or chapter 10, verses 5 through 13, tells us that salvation is for everyone that believes in the Word of God and that professes Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior with his mouth. So that's anyone. Everyone. Every single person that was born or created on this earth God had a plan to redeem them before time even began. To help you out with this, I'm going to take off my glasses. Because whenever I take off my glasses, all the faces, except for the young gentleman that's sitting up front, is blurry. I can't even see the words that's on the back wall. Well, I can see the big words on the back wall. But the words for the scripture and stuff, I can't read those without my glasses. So whenever we look at this and whenever we enter into our life, we have a set of lenses that we look at the world through. We look at the world through what we have been taught and what we have learned from our parents from our teachers throughout kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. If you went on to college, if you went to a technical school, you've learned from there. If you moved out and you went into the work world, you still learned. I am still learning things today. Believe it or not, I am still learning things today. But we learn and we see, but we we learn through the lenses that we look at. Or that we look through. So I have my trusty reading glasses. So I put my trusty reading glasses on. And the ones on the front row here, they get really blurry. And I can't even see y'all out there. But I can see the words right here. So whenever we look at this, and I want you to pull, I'm going to pull this in. Because whenever we see this, the faith that we have, the saving faith that we have, comes from the belief in God's Word. We believe that the Word of God, His Scripture that we have, we read this and we believe it. We listen to our friends tell us the stories. We listen to them and we hear them. So our philosophy and our belief comes from God's Word. So we look at things through the lenses of, Of God's word. But whenever the world comes along. And we're growing up. We then begin to look at things. Through the world's view. So we put these on. And we can see way out there. But these close things kind of get blurry. The things that we've been taught. God's word that we have. It begins to get blurry. And we begin to follow. The worldly things. But then what do we do? We come and we take these little glasses. And we say, okay God, I've wandered away from you. I'm going to come back to you. So I'm going to take God's words glasses and I'm going to put those on. But we've been taught by the world. So we have to put the worldly glasses on. And we're trying to figure life out. And now I can absolutely see nothing. Because the close is blurry because I have the far on. And the far is blurry because I have the close on. So everything is blurred. So I'm trying to live this life as I'm trying to live it through God's word. But yet God's word is blurred because I am looking at it through the worldly view. Whew, man, that preaches. Through the worldly view. So what we have to do is we have to take off the world's lenses and begin to look at life through God's word. 
And whenever we look at the life through God's word, it does not tell us that we're going to have a rose garden. It tells us that we're going to live a life that is stressed. Joseph was sent to Egypt before his brothers, before his family, to preserve life because there was a famine that was going to come on and the famine was going to last seven years. Joseph makes this statement to his brothers two years within the famine. So they still had five more years to go with the famine whenever his family was coming to Egypt to get food because they were about to die in the promised land. So we see this and we've got to pull all of this in to be able to find out and see what this life is that God really has for us. In the midst of this life that we have for God. There's struggles that happen to us or that come upon us because there's someone else that's in this world that is creating chaos and trouble for us. For Joseph, it was his brothers. Right? Joseph had issues with his brothers. His brothers are the one that captured him whenever his father sent him out there to see what they were doing. He had to go all the way out to Dothan to be able to find his brothers. He finds them out there in Dothan. And what do they do? They capture him. They throw him into a cistern or they throw him into a pit. How many of y'all remember that little poster and stuff that showed a pit? Okay, And there was a guy that was down in the bottom of the pit. And it had seeds, and or not seeds, it had cherries in there. Y'all remember that? Okay, all right. I had a class that was taught by Zig Ziglar, you know, good in, good out. You know, so if your pit is full of cherries, I guess that's why I like cherries so much. Uh, you know, your life is roses, right? It's, it's all great because you have all these cherries in there. You can just eat them all you want. No, like... He was thrown into... I'm sorry, I diverse really quick there. But he was thrown into the pit. And you remember Reuben told him to throw him into the pit because he wanted to come back and save him later on, save him later on so he could go back to his father. Reuben did something that was right, but whenever Reuben came back, he was no longer in the pit because the brothers, the other brothers, as they were sitting there eating lunch, they saw this merchant train going along. So they sold him into the tra- they sold him, and that's how he made it, made his way into Egypt. So Joseph began to suffer, not because of something that he did. Well, wait a minute. Joseph had part in this, didn't he? Because Joseph was a tattletale. Joseph went out into the field one day with his mom or with his brothers. And what did he do? They did something that was bad, so he went running to dad. How many of you have ever done that or have ever had a brother do that? Yeah, you know, hey, I, you know, I'm the baby of the family, and I never did anything like that. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. So Joseph, so Joseph kind of created it a little bit here. Now, there was also something on the outside factoring in on this as well, right? What about his dad, Jacob? Jacob kind of poured fuel on that fire, right? Joseph kind of puts a little spark to it whenever he tattles on his brothers. And then his dad really puts fuel to the fire whenever he gives him this special robe. If you're interested in where this is, this is all coming from uh, Genesis 37. Those first three verses right there. He gives him this beautiful colored robe. The colors on it tells us that it was worth it, that it was well made. And his father spent a lot of money on it. Because it had multiple colors in it. The other thing that we find out from this is, is that the sleeves on it was long and it was draped all the way down to his feet. So he was not going to be out in the field doing any type of sheeping or herding of sheep whatsoever. All that hard work was left to his brothers. Y'all just like that, right? I remember I was too young to cut the grass. So my brother had to cut the grass. Now it was very short lived that I had that opportunity. 
I didn't have that ability to, to do that. I know it wasn't because my dad loved me more than my brother. But how do we look upon people that don't work or don't do the work that, that we do? Okay, so here's the ouch then, because we do it to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. I do this for God. Why don't you do it? I've taught Sunday school for 40 years. Why can't you teach Sunday school? I'll quit meddling. Let me actually get into the message. Faith, saving faith, comes from believing in God. Comes from looking through the right lenses. Paul says that if we have faith in God, and we receive Him as our Lord and Savior, and we profess Him. Now, it's not only, it's, it's, it's this fact that we believe in Him, we believe in His Word, but then whenever we believe, it makes a difference in our lives that we then actually profess what we believe. So let's look through Joseph's life. So he's been sold into slavery. And he goes and we find him that he gets into Potiphar's house. And every single thing that he does in Potiphar's house, it multiplies or it's blessed by God. So God is blessing Joseph. And as he's blessing Joseph, he's blessing Potiphar. And his house begins to... So Joseph moves from one, one hierarchy place to another, to another. And then we find that he becomes second in command over Potiphar's house. Joseph tells Potiphar's wife that there is absolutely nothing that my master withholds from me in his house except for you. So in other words, he had control of all the other slaves. He had control of the food that was brought in. He had control of the animals, the cattle, the field, all of those. Joseph had control over it. All except for his wife. And his wife tempts him and Joseph flees. So then she falsely accuses him and then he goes into prison. And then we find as Joseph's in prison that he then begins to move up in the ranks of the prison. Now, I don't understand the prison system back then, but Joseph actually became where he was pretty much second in command over the prison because the only person that was over him would have been the guard that was over that prison that he was in, that area that he was in. God saw favor on him and blessed him. But it wasn't easy. You remember the robe that we just got through talking about? I imagine that whenever the scripture says that Joseph was pleasant to look at, he was handsome, I bet you he had that nice olive complexion, nice smooth skin that all women want to have. I bet you there was not a callous one on his hand. But now he's been sold into slavery. He's worked. There's now calluses on his hands. His beautiful robe is nothing but a distant memory. We see that as he moved up in the ranks in Potiphar's house that everything seemed like it was going great. And next thing you know, he's, he's back into the prison, into the dungeon. And then we find that as he's there in the dungeon and he's... I, you know, this is not pleasant things. So, you know, they, they didn't know anything about prison rights back then. I imagine that there was rats the size of dogs or cats in those days back you know, underneath there that he was with. And he was there with that. They, they didn't get a shower every morning. They didn't have soap on a rope or not on a rope. It was not a pleasant place to be. But God was still with him. Whenever Joseph interpreted the dreams for the baker and for the cupbearer, who did he say gave him the ability to do that? God. 
He always, regardless of where Joseph was in his life, whether he was in Potiphar's house, he gave God the glory. Or he was in the dungeon in prison, he gave God the glory. Or whenever he was at Pharaoh, he gave God the glory. I, you know, we have to understand that the people of those days knew about God. They knew about Joseph's God. The God that created all things. The God that sustains all things. They, he, they knew about him. Joseph moved up through the ranks. And we see that God's hand was always upon him. But why was God's hand upon him? To preserve life. Not for Joseph. It wasn't for Jacob or Israel or his family. Scripture says, and some of the translations says that it was for Egypt. Because at that point in time, Egypt pretty much controlled the whole world. As far as where they were and the scope of where people were. But we look at this and God is telling us that, again, that salvation is for every single person. Everyone that believes on Him. The world. The world that we're living in today. It's struggling. Uh, you know, we, we have people today that's trying to rewrite history books. You can, you can take a name out of the history books. You can remove a monument. But it doesn't diminish the work that has been done. Now, I, I understand. Now, now, don't get me wrong. There's statues of Washington that's been taken down. There's statues and all these things that's being taken down. Yes, slavery. Yes, slavery is bad. Uh, you know, but they did it. But they did a lot of good things. George Washington, the first president of the United States, and how he brought us together, how we were able to come out of the tyranny of the British government and their rule to be able to come and to be able to know the United States as we know it today. If it wasn't for George Washington, or if it wasn't for George Washington and God's hand being upon him, where would we be at? Those group of people in those days that you're trying to get rid of, where would we be? Yes, they did bad, but they also did good. That brings me to it. That verse chapter 37 begins the story of Joseph. Chapter 38 kind of takes a break in Joseph's life and begins to talk about a woman by the name of Tamar. Do any of y'all remember Tamar? Tamar was the wife of of one of Reuben's sons that died before she was able to have or give birth to a son. Now in those days you had to have a son to be able to have someone to provide for you because a woman, she wasn't going to get out there in the fields and she wasn't going to work and she wasn't going to have any worth whatsoever because her worth came from her male sons. So from there, the, you know, the law said that, that Reuben's brother or that the son of Reuben, that his brother is supposed to marry her so that she would then heir or give birth to a son so that she would have someone to produce for. Uh, you know, well, he dies before she does this. And then Reuben is there and he's like, oh, wait a minute, I've already lost two sons to her. Kind of like the black widow thing, right? You know, I've lost two sons to her, so I'm not going to make my youngest son marry her because he might die. So Reuben doesn't do what the law says he's supposed to do. So Tamar goes in and she tricks Reuben and she dresses like a harlot, a prostitute, has sex with him. I'm sorry if there's any young people there. Has sex with him, becomes pregnant, and then he, is, he puts her back into her right place 
because he was wrong. He redeemed her, restored her name. Now, pastor, why in the world are you telling me about this crazy woman in this here? Because she is part of the lineage of King David. And King David is part of the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Someone that was broken. Tamar. What she did wasn't right. But why she did it became righteous. And then she became part of the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But not only that, we look at David. David had an affair with Bathsheba. David killed Bathsheba's wife so that he could have her as his wife. Not only an adulterer, but a murderer. He is part of the lineage of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We can't get away from it. Regardless of how much the world wants to. As, lo- as much as they want to get rid of God. Everything that we have, our moral code of righteousness and justice comes from God. You can't say it doesn't because I'm an atheist. Because God put it in you whenever he created you. You know right from wrong. We just simply refuse to do it. And just because we refuse to do it doesn't mean that God didn't place it there to begin with. I don't care if if you believe in the Big Bang Theory, and I think this is interesting. There's more and more people that are going in and saying that, uh, you know, if the Big Bang Theory really happened, somebody or something had to cause the Big Bang. So whether or not you believe that the heavens and the earth was created in six days, or you believe that it was a Big Bang, somebody created the Big Bang, or somebody created the heavens and the earth in six days. God either created the Big Bang, or God created heaven and earth in six days. You can't do away from it. Our vision in the way that we look through things has to be looked through through the lenses of God Almighty, because He started it all. And what did He start? He started a plan for salvation for every single person that lives on this earth, or that has ever lived on this earth, or that will ever live on this earth. Salvation comes from the one that created it all. Because of His Son, Jesus Christ, that lived on this earth for 33 years, that died on the cross, was crucified, was dead and buried for our sins, our transgressions, but on the third day rose again. So that we would have a right relationship with God the Father. And as Paul says, if we believe that in our heart and we confess it with our tongues, then we are saved. But we look through the world, through God's lenses, not through the worldly lenses. And we definitely can't look through both. It's one or the other. We either look through God's lenses or we look through the world's lenses. You can't do both. You can't do both. Let's stop trying to rewrite history. And let's allow God to move in our hearts and in our lives so that we can make history. So that we can make history for Him. Psalms 105 is written as a remembrance. It tells us that it is God's faithfulness is its title. The very next chapter, Psalms 106, is God's people asking for forgiveness. 
because they didn't follow him as the one and true Lord and Savior. Yeah, we've messed up. All of us have. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've put on these glasses and looked at people and looked at the circumstances and the situations in my life. I even sat here this morning praying and talking to God. And then I complained. And he said, John, he said, whose eyes are you looking through? I had to take my glasses off. Number one, because I was crying so much. But whenever we begin to look at our lives through our glasses, we begin to try to fix them. But whenever we look at our lives through God's glasses, through His lenses, we know that we're saved because of who He is, because of what He's done, because of the salvation that He has provided for every single person. For every single person. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank You so much for today. God, I thank You for the words that You have given to us here. I thank You for the story of Joseph and how we read there in Genesis 45, 5, that you sent him before to save or to preserve life. You sent, their, you sent your son to this earth to preserve life. God, I pray, dear Lord, that each person that is here today or watching on the, on the TV, God, that they would accept your son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. Because he died on the cross for everyone to save us from our sins. To save us from this world. To save us from Satan's schemes. We thank you. We praise you. Amen. They continue to play. I don't know what set of glasses that you have on this morning, but if you happen to have on the glasses of the world, God wants to give you a new pair of glasses and the altar is open. It might be that for some reason and somehow today you actually have both pair of glasses on, that you're trying to see this world through the God's eyes, but also through the worldly eyes. God wants to remove those glasses from you this morning. 
the altar is open. If you have never received Him as your Lord and Savior, today's the time. Today you have that opportunity. So as they continue to sing this, I would ask that everyone here would stand and sing these words along with them. But if you need to come to the altar, the altar is open. And I know that someone will be here to pray for you and to touch you. Sing Amen.
in a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening and you're coming and you're going and you're weeping and rejoicing he is for you 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 still really weak so I think we're going to have to sing that over again so let's sing he is for you just the part he is for you I don't think you believe it I, you know he is for you he has everything and every plan to prosper you he has set plans forth for you to save you to give you eternal life he is for you he is Sing it like we know it and like we mean it. He is for you. Sing and shout. He is for you. 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 He is for you, 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 sing amen. Ah. 